Hello friends and welcome to Limitless Life. I am Larry Hutton and Merry Christmas. This is Christmas week and so we are having a Merry Christmas week. Today is December 22nd and uh, as I said yesterday, we are going to spend this whole week taking time off from our regular teaching series that we've been doing and just spend the whole week about Christmas. Uh, uh, last program yesterday, I closed mentioning uh, some recordings that I did and I wanted to expound, elaborate. I did it in such a hurry yesterday. But we have three things you, that I just really encourage you and you, they make great gifts if you want to get them for people as well. But these are instrumental recordings. You can get them in CD, you can download them in MP3. But what I did is I went uh, three different places around the nation and I found world-class musicians, keyboard being their main uh, instrument, but they played a lot of instruments. But I asked them, I said, you know, I want to go into the studio. I want you to go into the studio and I want you to listen to me quote the word. And while I'm quoting the word, then I want you out of your heart, I want you to begin playing to the Lord. And so, man, we did, <clears throat> we started in uh, Atlanta, Georgia area with this musician and um, it was just awesome, man. After, <laughs> after we spent the whole time, I, each one of these are like an hour or longer. And there's no singing, no talking. It's just instrumental. And uh, it was like, when we got done with this one, it was like you could cut a chunk of peace. <laughs> you know, we, we named this Peace Be Still. The second one we named uh, Perfect Peace. And the third one, Great Peace. And uh, so... Anyway, it was just like you could chunk, uh, cut a chunk of piece out and take it home with you. But we did that on three different occasions. We did it with uh, that in, in Atlanta and then two other places. And um, they just came out so wonderful. All three of them totally different. And yet they just set an atmosphere, an atmosphere conducive for peace and rest and tranquility and joy and happiness. And so anyway, I wanted to mention those to you. Uh, that we have them. The first one we put out is Peace Be Still. The second we put out is Perfect Peace. And the third one we put out is Great Peace. And so I want to encourage you to get those for yourself or get them as gifts for others. I know they'll be a blessing to you. So we are taking this week, we're addressing the natural things of Christmas as well as the supernatural things of Christmas. Yesterday we did talk about both natural and supernatural. In fact, yesterday we talked about Santa Claus. Imagine that. If you, if you missed yesterday, you want to catch it. I mean, really, we, had, we went back and we talked about the origin of the modern day Santa Claus and the story of the real Saint Nick. Uh, he was born in Patera, uh, Lycia, which is uh, now a part of present day Turkey. But the story is quite amazing. And I encourage you to listen to that. If you go back and listen to it, if you didn't get a chance to. And then we talked real quick in closing yesterday. I actually mentioned uh, what Jesus is referred to in, or who Jesus is referred to in all 66 books of the Bible. Boy, I had to go through that quick. If you were with me, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, I told you we were going to have fun this week and we were going to be examining all the natural things of Christmas and talk about the supernatural things. So uh, it's just, it's going to be a fun week. We'll continue today. So let's start today by discussing, discussing some of the uh, customs uh, that we Christians have concerning Christmas. First of all, I hear uh, Christians complaining about um, something on a regular basis. So let's talk about this first of all. Uh, what about the date of December 25th? that we use here in this country and other countries in the world that use to celebrate the birth of Jesus. I hear Christians uh, complaining and say, well, that date is not accurate. It's not the date Jesus was born. And you know what? They're right. <laughs> and then there's others complain about a lot of our current traditions of Christmas, um, such as the use of Christmas trees and decorating Christmas trees and using colorful lights and the giving of gifts and on and on and on we go. But people have pointed out that our traditions as Christians uh, celebrating Christmas, that, they, that our traditions have their roots in pagan practices and pagan religions. So 
I'm going to talk about that first of all. Let's just take a moment to discuss that. Um, and I'm going to first of all address the concern of the date that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Christmas is not a date. Christmas is a time of celebration, not a date that we celebrate. Do you hear what I said? Christmas is a time of celebration, not a date that we celebrate. At Christmas, we don't celebrate December 25th. We celebrate the day of our Lord Jesus' birth on that day. So think about this. If you have a problem with celebrating Jesus on that day, um, we Christians, you know, we always say this, we don't celebrate Jesus just on Christmas, we celebrate Him every day, right? Well, that's true. But every day of the year is a date. So when you celebrate Jesus on any day of the year, most of them are going to be on dates that are not the real date of His birth. So why are you celebrating Jesus' birth on that date? <laughs> See what I'm saying? <laughs> So as far as December 25th goes, we don't celebrate the date, but we do use the date to celebrate Jesus. Uh, actually, Christmas, let's talk about Christmas. Christmas was celebrated, um, the first one, um, in the early 4th century. It dates back that far. But America now didn't have uh, Christmas, at, as, at least as a federal holiday, until 1870. So... I just wanted you to know that. But let me address the other concerns um, about our traditions of Christmas trees and lights and gift giving and all that stuff. Because um, they are, when I studied history, I noticed that our practices, our traditions are very similar to those enjoyed by our pagan ancestors. They gave gifts, they had parties, they had dancing and singing, they had festivals and festivities with lots of celebrations and lots of food and beverage and laughing and they, they had a fun time. They had a good time. However, for them, the pagan religions that, that celebrated, um, it was a celebration of survival of a harsh winter. So their celebration was a survival celebration. For us Christians, our celebration is not a survival celebration. It's a revival celebration. Man, Jesus came to revive us, to restore us, to redeem us, to lead us back from death to life, from separation from God to reunion with God. Jesus came to restore us back to favor with God. Therefore, for, for Christians... The primary reason for celebrating Jesus is believing that God came into the world in the form of man to atone for the sins of humanity. And that is far more important than knowing Jesus' exact date of birth. I hope you're following this. I mean, because this, this, this is my favorite time of year. And let me explain. Let me explain why Christmas time is my favorite time of year. And the main reason is because of the extra emphasis that is placed upon Jesus. There is no other celebratory season of the year that lasts as long as the Christmas season. I mean, think about it. For over a month, over two months some places, but for, for well over a month, there are Christmas songs continually played on multitudes of radio stations. There are Christmas plays, not just at churches, but at civic centers. There are Christmas TV shows. There are Christmas movies that talk about Jesus the Savior. Uh, the Christmas theme of Jesus' birth, you know, with manger scenes, is displayed on people's lawns, on rooftops, on fireplace mantles, on Christmas trees, just about everywhere you go. And in many places, including our country, thank God, uh, you will steer, still hear the salutation, Merry Christmas! <laughs> now, just so you know, those words, Merry Christmas, um, originated really to propagate the gospel. We'll talk about that more in a, 
a moment. But the word Christmas, let's talk about the word Christmas. It wasn't actually used with early Christians when they celebrated the birth of Jesus. It wasn't actually until the Middle Ages that the term Christmas was even used. Uh, the word Christmas is made up of two words, Christ, Moss, Christmas. Uh, in the mind of many Christians, the word Christ is actually commonly used as part of Jesus' name, Jesus Christ, and so they think it's part of His name. But the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, meaning uh, the Messiah, meaning the anointed one. It means anointed or the anointed one, but it also means a Messiah. It's translated from the Hebrew word, however you pronounce it, Mishiach, I think, something like that. It means anointed of the Lord, and it means Messiah. The word moss, that's the word Christ, the word moss has evolved from an old English word masse, meaning festival. Uh, it means festival or feast day or mass and refers to a celebration. So when you put the two words Christ moss together, Christmas means a celebration of the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus. <laughs> Now, there are those who purported that the word moss in Christmas actually means death and have tried to put black connotations on it, but that simply is not true. If you study out the word moss, it's actually a shortened version of masse. Uh, that's derived from a Latin word, missa, and that was translated into English to mean uh, dismissal. Uh, because it was used to conclude a Catholic Mass. For those of you that are Catholic, you probably know this. At the end of Mass, the priest utters the words, uh, Iti Misa Est, meaning go, it is the dismissal. However, once the, the word Christmas, Christmas began to be used by Christians, it took on a far dip, different meaning than a dismissal. It actually took on the meaning and suggestion of uh, not the end of something, but the beginning of something, a mission. The celebration of Christmas, Christmas uh, gives us Christians a mission to spread Jesus and God's love to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come, right? So, uh, so this is what Christmas is all about. So let's talk about something else. In fact, let me inject this before I go on. Um, Something that used to bother me a whole lot, and it's probably bothered you, and some of you may not know what I'm about to share, but it bothered me when people were writing, C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S, -S, writing Christmas, but they would delete Christ and put the, word, put the letter X and then write Xmas. Did that bother you? I, I know it bothered a lot of people. Um, but when I was studying that one day, I discovered the first letter of the Greek word for Christ is X. And it's pronounced Kai, I think that's K-A-I, however you pronounce it in Greek. And it's been used throughout history to represent Jesus' title. So the abbreviated term Xmas is not trying to take Christ, not according to them anyway, the Greek culture. It's not taking Christ out of Christmas. It is, it is keeping him there. So anyway, back to the word Christmas. I was reading out of Webster's Dictionary. Uh, Christmas is a Christian feast that commemorates the birth of Christ. The encyclopedia calls Christmas the feast of the nativity. So Christmas, therefore, is a Christian feast and a Christian celebration. So the quick question becomes then, so is God against us celebrating and having feasts and festivals? Well, actually, when I read the Bible, I found out God is the originator of feasts for, the, for His children. All throughout the Bible, God initiated feasts as a way for His people to remember something that God had done for them. I'm going to give you two examples here today of feasts mentioned in the Bible. In my opinion, these two that I'm going to mention are probably the most significant feasts that are mentioned in Scripture. So turn over to Exodus 12. In Exodus 12, uh, it's the passage that details about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was actually a seven-day feast. It is also known as the Lord's Passover. Um, and it's also referred in John's Gospel as the Feast of the Jews. 
So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, the Lord's Passover, the Feast of the Jews. Here in Exodus, God told Moses and the children of Israel to take a male lamb, one without blemish, he said, and kill it in the evening. And they were, gonna, they were supposed to take, <coughs> excuse me, they were supposed to take the blood of that sacrificed lamb and strike it on the two side posts of, and on the upper door post of their homes. And then they were supposed to roast the lamb and then they were supposed to eat it. And then verse 11 says that it is the Lord's, if you look at that in Exodus 12, 11, it is the Lord's Passover. But he tells us why in verses 12 through 14. Look at verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now, this shall, uh, now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast. I want you to see that. Keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting covenant. Of course, those of you who have studied this out, we know that this is a type of Jesus who is our Passover lamb, right? In fact, look at, well, let me show you. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the end of the verse. The end of 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So let's put that together with 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 18 and 19 now. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Christ our Passover, right? Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So just like the children of Israel partook of the sacrificed lamb in Exodus 12 and used its blood to save them, we too get to partake of Jesus, our Passover, and get the, we get the whole package of salvation. We don't just get forgiven of sins, man. We get the whole package. Remember Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. We have it a lot better than they did. And then, so that's one feast I wanted to mention. The other feast I wanted to mention is one that will, you know, this feast that I'm about to tell you about, it's going to be an earmark in the ages to come. Uh, it's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And for time's sake, I'm not going to turn there, but in Revelations 9.9, uh, wow, what a feast this is going to be, man. It says we're going to be clothed in His righteousness. Uh, we're going to sit down with Jesus at a banqueting table, and we're going to enjoy a feast like none has ever been known. Man, boy. But my, talk, my, my point in talking about uh, these feasts is that God likes feasts. He's the originator of them. And there are uh, several Hebrew words used to define the word uh, feast. But in essence, they suggest that a feast is an appointed time or an appointed season to hold a festival, uh, to hold a feast, and it's a time of celebration. Uh, Proverbs 15, 15. Look at that. He who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. <laughs> Our hearts should be merry because of birth of Jesus, right? So let's feast, man. Let's have some fun. Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says, A feast is made for laughter. I told you we're going to have fun this week. Why not laugh and have fun about the birth of Jesus? Praise God. Let's, let's feast together. Let's laugh together. Let's have fun together. Let's enjoy the time together as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, another question that some people have asked is it okay to celebrate Christmas with trees, with lights and tinsel and gift giving and the banquets and so forth? Well, um, they actually use trees and branches to celebrate Jesus in the Bible. So let's look at that. When, you remember when he had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem? Let's look at that over in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem 
to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. He said, go to the village opposite you. As soon as you've entered it, you're going to find a colt there. Loose it and bring it to me. Verse 3, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? The Lord, just tell them the Lord needs it and they'll let you have it. Verse 4, so they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street and they loosed it. Verse 5, but some of them who stood there said, why are you taking the colt? Verse 6, they spoke just like Jesus said, you know, in other words, the Lord needs it, and they let him go. Verse 7, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their clothes on the road. So here they are using clothes to honor Jesus and to glorify and celebrate Jesus. Um, they put clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So here now they are using branches and trees to glorify God. Verse 9, Then those who went before them and those who followed them cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David uh, that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So I wanted you to see they used bright clothes to celebrate Jesus. They used trees to celebrate Jesus. So why shouldn't we? Right? We ought to use everything. We ought to use everything that's beautiful, everything that's bright, everything that's glowing to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So what about the question of gift giving? Uh, actually, the giving of gifts to celebrate the birth of Jesus started in the Bible. Uh, if you go to Matthew chapter 2 and read the story there, uh, Jesus was born in verse 1 in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, that was during the days of Herod. And the wise men came from the east to Jerusalem and they talked to Herod saying, where is this that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and we've come to worship him. And Herod, of course, you know, he was evil. Herod, the king, heard it was troubled and so was all Jerusalem. So they gathered the chief priests and the scribes and asked him, so where was this Christ supposed to be born? And the scribes and the Pharisees and all told him in Bethlehem, for that's written by the prophet. And verse 7, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the st star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. So he's, you know, he's wanting to kill Jesus, but he sends them to Bethlehem and says, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you found him, Bring back word to me so that I can come and worship him also. Liar, liar, pants on fire, right? <laughs> Verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures. They presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then divinely uh, warned in a dream that they should not go back to Herod and tell him. They went another way. Skip down to verse 16. When Herod saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was angry. He sent forth uh, uh, his army to put death put to death all the male children who were born in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he determined from the wise men. There's a lot that can be taught from this passage of Scripture. But let me just point out a few things here, and we'll have to pick it up tomorrow. We won't have time today. But notice wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, verse 1 says, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and come to worship him. The Greek word used here for wise men is the word magos. Uh, it refers to oriental scientists. And according to Strong's, it even can imply a magician. Thayer's Greek concordance points out that it was a name given by the Babylonians or Chaldeans and also by the Medes and the Persians and others to wise men, uh, to men that were teachers, men that were priests, men that were physicians, men that were astrologers, men that were seers like prophets and interpreters of dreams. I was reading from Albert Barnes' commentary, and he said that we get our word magician from this word, and it is now used in a bad sense, but not so in the original. Uh, Barnes points out that it was not uh, um, used uh, in a bad sense in the original, that it was referring to philosophers and priests and astronomers. 
Um, and it says, in, Barnes said, they were learned men from either Persia or Arabia, both of them in the uh, east of Judea. And so he says, uh, Barnes says, they were devoted to astronomy, to religion, to medicine. They were held in high esteem by the Persian court, admitted as counselors, and followed the camps in war to give advice. So we don't know if they were kings or not because no scripture calls them kings, but uh, then again, no scripture says that there were uh, three wise men either. Uh, I'm going to have to pick that up tomorrow. But, you know, we have our Christmas songs and we have our Christmas manger scenes and, and you know, all about we three kings of Orient are. And, and they come, you know, and, and they find Jesus at the manger. That's not what this passage says at all. This passage says Jesus was between one and two years old. That's why Herod commanded every child under two to be put to death because he inquired the time, found out, okay, he's somewhere between one and two. And you saw he was in a house, not at the manger when they came and worshiped him. We're gonna talk about this tomorrow. In fact, I'm gonna kick over these sacred cows. There were not three wise men. I'm gonna prove it by the word tomorrow. There were not three wise men and there's no way to prove they were kings. And, and furthermore, they didn't come to the manger. They came to a house when he was, just, when he was a toddler. All right, well, we'll pick up this next, next program. Man, have fun this week. Merry Christmas. We love you. We call you blessed. Until next time, have a wonderful Jesus-filled day and Christmas. Bye-bye. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call one 888 Word. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, or you can call 888-887-WORD.